second video of the Yoga Anatomy series, and this board is about the language of movement. So in the last video, we talked about um, some of the different terms that give us reference points of how things are related to each other. And then with this one, we're going to start talking about the movements of the body and the anatomical terminology that we use to isolate different movements. So we start out from this very simplified version. I know it probably doesn't look like a simplified version, but when we go through these movements, we're talking about pure movements. And what I mean by that is we're isolating a single direction of movement, and we hardly ever do a movement at one joint in one plane completely isolated. It's just not functional. And in terms of yoga, the movements that we do are rather complicated and they involve so many different patterns and movements in our body that there's a very complex combination of any of these movements in just one single pose at every single joint in the body. So when we start breaking down what the poses are actually made of in terms of anatomical movements, um, it gets to be kind of a, a fun little game. But first we'll go over exactly what the anatomical terminology is for the movements that each joint is capable of doing, um, and hopefully <laughs> safely. That's the important part. I like to do a top-down approach. So we'll start out with the neck, and specifically the cervical spine. So just the top part, and I won't get too much into the bones today because we'll do bones in another video. But for the cervical spine, it does what we call the six movements of the spine. And in yoga, this is very frequently used in a warm-up sequence. We might do neck movements in any different direction, and then some movements in the spine because we want to warm up the center of the body before we go into our deeper yoga postures. So know the six movements of the spine pretty well, and it applies to all the different areas, the cervical spine, which is the neck, the thoracic spine, or the T-spine, which is like the mid-back, and the lumbar spine, which is your lower back. Again, we'll talk about that when we go over the bones more. But the, the cervical spine starts with those six movements. We do flexion, which is bringing your chin down toward your chest. Extension is back and looking up toward the ceiling. Now keep in mind, like we talked about in the last video, all of the movements are explaining how you deviate away from anatomical position. So this person, or this half of a person that we're looking at right now, there's the other half, um, they're standing in anatomical position. They're straight, the arms are down by the sides, the palmar surface is facing forward, the feet are hip distance apart. Don't get confused by the sideways feet, I just draw it that way so that you can see them. The feet are facing straight forward and they're hip distance apart. But sometimes people get confused with the neck movements, um, that flexion is going down, and extension, when you come up, you are technically moving into extension, but when we take a measurement of how far you can move your neck into extension, it starts from neutral, and it's how far you can move back. Okay, So always come back to that neutral anatomical position and see what the movement is away from that. Lateral flexion to the left and to the right. So lateral flexion for any spot in the spine is when we go sideways. It's when we side bend. It's a really great neck stretch to do that when you're warming up. Rotation left and right is pretty self-explanatory. Um, that's just isolating at the neck. And then the one strange thing that we can do at our neck is protraction and retraction. And this is important for yogis because a lot of people are going to be in your class or you might find yourself doing this where you stick your head forward and your neck gets this sort of forward cascade to it. You want to bring yourself back and retract the spine or the cervical spine so that you have a natural curve in your neck, but you don't want to do that forward head posture. This is protraction and this is retraction. You're going to hear that term again with the scapula. But those are the six main movements of the spine and then that extra protraction and retraction that our spine likes or our neck likes to do. So then we'll go down to the scapula or the shoulder blade because we haven't talked about bones yet. The shoulder blade is really critical, specifically the position of the shoulder blade and the stability of the shoulder blade 
when you are doing arm balances or even just plank and chaturanga, anything that there's weight bearing through the arms, downward facing dog, it's really critical that you understand where the scapula is supposed to be and how we stabilize it. So the scapula movements are elevation and then moving down is depression. You squeeze the lower points of your shoulder blades down and it makes your neck longer. So elevation and depression, protraction and retraction like we talked about with the neck forward and back, the shoulder blades protract and the shoulder blades retract. And then there's these two interesting movements that make the shoulder blade a little tricky. It's upward rotation and downward rotation. So normally, here's our scapula on our back. They're straight up and down. They're not tilted forward or back. We want them very neutral. But when we go to lift our arm up, the scapula has to move with the arm, with the humerus, in order to make that movement happen. Upward and downward rotation is the movement of the scapula that allows your arm to go up specifically past 90 degrees. But if you have somebody around, you're going to have them stand with their back toward you, put your hand on top of their shoulder blade, and just ask them to raise their arm up and down and watch the shoulder blades go out and come back together. As the arm goes up, they swing out, and as the arm comes down, they swing back in. So, very interesting movement with the shoulder blade and um, when there's instability in those movements, it can cause issues with overhead reaching or postures where there's a lot of um, pressure on the arms and overhead. Specifically, think like downward facing dog. That can be a really challenging position when the scapula isn't moving correctly or stabilizing correctly. So we'll try to keep this pattern of moving from the top to the bottom and I'll try not to skip any. Um, the next two I'll talk about is a pair, so the sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint, two ends of your collarbone or your clavicle, um, and we uh, usually write them as the SC joint or the AC joint, just for brevity, but um, the sternoclavicular joint is the place where the sternum, so the breastbone, and the clavicle or the collarbone join together. And this is such an interesting space in the body because it's the only bony attachment that our whole upper limb has to the center of our body, to the rest of our skeleton. That's it. All the rest of it is held in place by muscle. So this joint is super important to allowing our shoulder to move the way that it does. And you can feel that by finding the medial end of your collarbone and put your fingers right on either side of it and start to move your shoulder into protraction and retraction, elevation and depression, and feel the collarbones swing up and down and forward and back. It's a really interesting joint. You can even kind of think of a little bit of circumduction there because when you circle your shoulder, the end of the collarbone here follows it. It's almost a circular kind of movement. So that's the sternoclavicular joint. And then we go down to the other end of the clavicle, which is the acromioclavicular joint. So it's where the acromion, the top little bony part that comes off of our shoulder blade or our scapula, joins to the collarbone. It's another point in that chain that connects our arm toward our body. So the acromio acromioclavicular joint is a much more stable joint. There isn't as much movement there, but it does help with elevation, depression, protraction, retraction when we move the shoulder blade or the arm. So it just helps to make our shoulder that super mobile joint that it is without restricting its movement. The important thing to know about the acromioclavicular joint though is that it's frequently injured. If somebody falls and goes to catch themselves, they can separate that joint. And if somebody walks into your yoga class and they have a history of an acromioclavicular separation or an AC joint problem, they're going to have issues with arm balancing again. Um, so you just want to keep that in mind. You might have to modify some of those poses. Okay, so we got the sternoclavicular movements, we got the acromioclavicular movements, not a whole lot of movement there, but there's a little bit enough to talk about. And then we come to the shoulder. So any of those joints, the movements of the scapula, the AC joint, the SC joint, 
those are all really important to the way that our actual shoulder joint functions. So for the shoulder, we have that ball and socket, and it is the most mobile joint in our body, which is great because it allows us to do all of these reaching movements in any different direction. Behind the back, we can put our arm pretty much anywhere, but the issue with that is that because most of the joint is made up of muscle and soft tissue, it also makes our shoulder really vulnerable to injury, especially in a yoga class. Because if you have a beginner who comes into your yoga class, they don't do a lot of upper weight, upper body weight bearing, maybe they don't do any weight training or anything like that. Their arm strength and scapula stability and shoulder stability is probably not that great. And now they're trying to hold downward facing dog for as long as the other students who have been practicing for a while. It's kind of a recipe for possible injury. So that's somewhere that you really want to encourage new students coming into class to rest because the shoulder joint is so vulnerable. Downward facing dog, again, is a, one of those poses. Chaturangas, doing too many planks, it's going to put the shoulder joint at risk. But let's talk about the movements that happen at the shoulder joint. So again, pure movements, we're going to break them up into flexion, which is lifting the arm up, and then extension, when I'm bringing my arm down, I'm moving it into extension, but extension is technically from right next to my body, moving behind me. So that's extension. That's where I would measure how many degrees of extension my shoulder has. Okay, so flexion, and then extension is behind the back. Just straight back, don't rotate. Um, abduction and adduction. This is one of the terms that can get a little bit confusing and I just wrote ADD and ABD because that B and D are the difference between those words and they sound so similar that a lot of times when we're talking about anatomy and we're using these words we'll say adduction instead of adduction or abduction instead of abduction just to make it sound a little bit clearer so we don't confuse them. But any movement where we're abducting, we're abducting, think of like somebody being abducted or taken away. You're taking your arm and you're moving it away from the center line. That's abduction. And then adduction, you're adding it to the center line, so you're pulling it back in towards center. Um, and those two are paired together, those are opposites. I'm going to skip over internal and external rotation and come back to that. Horizontal adduction and abduction. Okay, so you have that tricky part of a deduction and a abduction again, but it's horizontal, so we're on the plane of the horizon, and if I start out with my arm right here, 90 degrees of flexion, but from there is where horizontal movements happen. I'm going to horizontally a deduct. I'm going to adduct, bring it over as far as I can, and then I'm going to horizontally a B duct or move it away from the center line. So those are two different movements that we can't do at any other joint. Horizontal abduction and adduction. Um, circumduction, because it's a ball and socket joint, we can circle the arm. Um, we use that a lot of times in warm-ups. I like to do circular movements for circular joints because you're going to get all different directions, all of the muscles that wrap around that joint. Um, so the one that I like to throw in is scaption, and this isn't technically one of the pure movements of the shoulder, but it's a plane of movement that you want to know because scaption is a pretty safe movement for the shoulder. It's where the shoulder is happy, and if somebody in your class or if you have a shoulder injury, rather than moving in pure flexion when you raise your arms up or pure abduction, you might want to do scaption instead, and you'll find that your shoulders might be happier at the end of your practice after lifting your arms over and over and over. So scaption is about halfway in between pure flexion and pure abduction. It's like 45 degrees off center. So when you have both arms in the scapular plane, you make this V shape with the arms instead of being straight forward or straight out to the sides into a T. It's a really comfortable space that makes it very easy for your scapula to follow your arm and upwardly rotate and then downwardly rotate as your arm comes down. Freeze up the scapula. So that's scaption. We're moving in the plane that makes your scapula happy. Okay, now let's circle back to internal and external rotation. 
because this is one that throws a lot of people off, but it's very critical to understand the difference between internal and external rotation in your yoga practice because it's the difference between keeping your shoulders happy and possibly getting a shoulder injury. So internal rotation and external rotation, you want to think of them from starting in anatomical position. And if you have your arm straight down, okay, and you roll your thumb in, feel what happens up here at your shoulder. There's this closing off and rolling in. So that's internal rotation. Okay, then external rotation, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to roll my thumb back and you feel this opening that happens. My collarbone feels really long and the front of my shoulder joint is nice and open when I do that. So try that again, internal rotation, I'm exaggerating that roll in with the shoulder. External rotation, rolling my thumb back and feel that space. So that always helps me to remember because once we start bringing the arm into different positions, it gets really confusing what's internal and what's external but always come back into anatomical position and think internal rolling medially, external rolling laterally, okay? So then you can take your arm out to the side and do the same thing. If I internally rotate and I drop my thumb down, the head of my humerus is going to follow and it's going to roll in, it's going to close me off. If I do that on both sides, you can see that hunching. And I'm going to roll my thumbs back and externally rotate, there's a natural lift that happens in the chest and this broadening. It's a really great space when you're doing breath work to keep that space up there. Okay, so now we're going up a little bit higher. You take your arms up into a cactus, which is one that we do pretty regularly. So this is a little bit of external rotation because we love cactus. It gives you that sense of being open and spacious across your heart. And then we go into internal rotation by dropping the hands down, feel the shoulder rolling in and that slight closing off. So that's external rotation, internal rotation. And you can really follow your breath nicely with that. Inhale exhale. Okay, and you'll see when you do that movement, your thoracic spine wants to follow you because there's a strong connection between what your shoulder does, what your scapula does, and the shape of your thoracic spine. So just keep that in mind for later. We'll go up a little bit higher. Okay, so right up behind the head, like you're relaxing in a hammock. And this is external rotation because if we start to take the hands out to the sides, we're back in that cactus position. And then we'll go a little bit farther than that. Think of Gomukhasana arms, right? When you have the top arm in and then the bottom arm is down. This is one that confuses a lot of people because your, your shoulders are rotating in opposite directions. Okay, so my top arm here is externally rotated because if I take my hand out, I have that open, lifted, rolled back position. But my bottom arm, even now you can see my shoulder is a little bit forward from where I would want it because that's internally rotated. If I move it out to the side, you'll start to see that hunched in position. Then if I straighten my arm like I'm in an anatomical position, it would be an internal rotation, a medial rotation. So in that same way, you can deconstruct your pose, kind of slowly pull yourself out of it and as you move from being in that pose, going back into anatomical position, you'll see what movements have to happen to come back into neutral. And that's going to tell you what the movement actions are of that pose. All right, so I think we've got the shoulder, right? We had flexion, extension, abduction, a deduction, that horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction, circumduction, Scaption, moving in the plane of the scapula, and external rotation and internal rotation. The reason that the rotation is so important is because we spend a tremendous amount of time internally rotated when we type on our computer that puts us in this habitually rounded internally rotated position. Our chest muscles get short and our back muscles get weak and overstretched and our rotator cuff gets imbalanced. 
So we want to train ourselves in yoga to bring that shoulder back and have some external rotation that firms the shoulder blade onto your back, rolls the head of the humerus out, keeps the shoulder in this position that's really safe, especially when we're up over the head. We do a lot of this in yoga. And if you're up here and you're rolled in, it's going to make your shoulder and your rotator cuff specifically very unhappy, especially if you do it over and over and over. So when you are up overhead, you want to get used to spinning your pinky. I do this little thing with my hand. You probably can't see it when I'm up like that. But you're spinning your pinky in toward the center line and think of bringing that all the way down your arm so that your shoulder is really spacious. When you do that, you're going to feel that your scapula upwardly rotates really nicely. It adds to that whole chain of movement up through your arms. But we'll talk more about that when I do the actual yoga practice to go over the movements, just so you know what to look for. All right, shoulder. So we're down to the elbow, and we love the elbow because it's easy. It's flexion and extension, okay? Flexion, extension. The thing you're watching for in yoga is that you don't want any hyperextension of the elbows. And some people are hypermobile and they tend to either lock the elbow joint or hyperextend it. I can't really hyperextend my elbow, but you'll know it'll bow the wrong way and it doesn't quite look right. When people are hypermobile and they do arm balances, they will have their elbow locked and hyperextended because it's easier. They don't have to use their muscles as much. And you're going to start to train them to just micro bend the elbow so that the actual muscles are stabilizing you and you're not tugging on the ligaments that stabilize your elbow. Because in the long run, that will cause issues. So that's the elbow. And then we go down to the forearm. And here we are in anatomical position. The arms are turned like that so that the palmar surface is forward. And that creates that evenness between the radius and the ulna. They're sitting right next to each other. But there's actually a movement that happens between those two forearm bones at the radial ulnar joint. And it is pronation, turning your palm down, and supination, or turning your palm up. And I like to remember supination like you're carrying a bowl of soup. It just kind of helps me to remember it. And then pronation, you turn the palm down. So pronation, palm down, supination, you're holding a bowl of soup. The, so that's the forearm, pronation, supination, that's the only movement that really happens there. Then the wrist is going to go a few different directions, and wrists are tricky joints in yoga. We do a lot of weight bearing through the hands, it can make the wrist joint a little bit unhappy. But, um, so we have flexion, and then we have extension. So remember, this is neutral, if I was in anatomical position my hand would be like that. Right, so it's flexion, extension. Okay, that probably makes more sense with the wrist, because if you think about how the arm moves, it would be the same thing. Flexion would be forward, and extension would be backward. So always go back to anatomical position, and think about the way that the movement goes from that space. Flexion and extension. Okay, now here's the strange one that our wrist does. It's radial deviation and ulnar deviation. So this is my radius the bone of my forearm. Radial deviation means moving my hand sideways toward the radius, back into neutral, and then moving my hand the other way toward the ulna. Radial and ulnar deviation. Because our wrist is so mobile, we can circumduct it. We can circle it. So the tricky movement in yoga is usually wrist extension, because there we are on the mat with our wrists bent and you have to really learn how to engage the muscles in the hands and how to distribute your weight toward the thumb side of your hand so that you take the weight out of that vulnerable end which is right over by the end of the ulna. Okay, the wrist. So the fingers, you can get pretty complicated with the hands, especially for beginning anatomy in yoga training. I would just know the most important ones, which would be flexion. The little joints in the fingers create flexion, they bend, and extension, and a little bit of hyperextension. But mainly, you're thinking about finger flexion 
as something that you're going to use to activate the what we call intrinsic hand muscles, the muscles that dwell inside the hand for support, to stabilize your hand and to create some strength there. Um, we call that Hasta Bandha in yoga. It's an energetic lock of your hand into the floor. So the phalanges, the fingers, do flexion and extension. You can, we'll name the joints when we get back into specific joints, but no flexion and extension. And then we have abduction, taking away from the center line. The middle finger forms the center line of your hand. All the fingers move away from it and come toward it. The middle finger stays still. A deduction, a deduction. Um, the thumb does this little palmer abduction and adduction and then regular adduction and abduction there. So it just moves in a different plane and that's because of the joint at the base of the thumb. It gives us basically the ability to do human manipulations using our thumb. But we'll talk about that thumb when we do the joints. So those are the important movements of the joints from the top down the arm. Now when we get to the thoracic spine, we're thinking about those same six movements that you can do with your cervical spine, right? You have flexion of the thoracic spine, you have extension of the thoracic spine, think like cobra pose, we're trying to get some thoracic extension. You have lateral flexion when you're doing a side bend, lateral flexion when you're doing a side bend, um, rotation and rotation left and right. Now the one movement that I want to talk about that you don't hear too much about, it's not one of the basic six, is axial elongation. Sometimes you'll hear this called axial extension. I don't like that term because it's confusing. There's no spine extension happening in that movement. But what axial elongation is, is taking the spine end to end and stretching it out. It's when you're in a seated posture and you try to lengthen your spine up, and you're decreasing that compressive force that tends to shorten us or put pressure on our discs. You'll see this have an effect on the curves of our spine. We have that natural curve at the back of our neck, a little bump out at the thoracic spine, and then that concave space in the lumbar spine. But when you take the ends of the spine and you stretch them away from each other, it slightly decreases the curves. Um, this is a technique that you'll see used a lot with people who have scoliosis or back problems, things that compression is going to make that condition worse. But it's also a way to prepare for certain poses or a way to approach your spine alignment in downward facing dog where you're trying to draw the hips back and take away that compressive force on the spine. So that also applies to the lumbar spine, the lower part of the spine. You have that same flexion and extension, so your lumbar spine goes forward and back. Think about that movement when you're doing cat and cow. You get a little bit of everything with cat and cow. Um, lateral flexion is just side bending to either side but from the lower back. Um, and then rotation left and right. You want to be careful with lumbar rotation because when you start to get really aggressive with turning from that space, then we start to make the SI joints or the sacroiliac joint a little bit unsteady. So we have to just be careful that we're not too aggressive with rotation in the lower back. Um, but we'll get more into that relationship in the next video. So that was our review of the language of movement and the movements that our joints are able to do in the upper body. And again, these are pure movements that show us how our body deviates away from anatomical alignment. When you get confused, come back into anatomical alignment, isolate that one movement at a time so that it seems a little bit clearer. Then as you get more comfortable with them, we can put them together into the complexity of yoga poses and start to kind of hash out exactly what's going on at what joint in what plane. Okay, so we'll get to that, but next we're going to do the lower body. So thank you for joining me. Namaste.